this is new. I mean, this is completely different, right? So the beautiful thing about, about MoneyGram is that we do have liquidity pools around the world. We move literally, you know, billions of dollars. Um, so the money is there. The question is, how do you move it efficiently? You guys have an amazing technology, interesting platform. Um, they can help us do that, but it needs to come to life. You need, you know, you need buyers and sellers, market makers, as you say, um, on both sides of the transaction to uh, actually make it efficient. Um, and I think that just takes time and momentum to build. So I think for us, that was kind of the big learning. I think when you joke that I'm pushing you, it's like, I'm like, come on, man, get the market open, let's get going. Um, but, but I realized that takes time. And, and, and so for me, that was, that was kind of a learning. I think the other big learning for me was um, probably the, the role the exchanges play, right? right? I was, <laughs> with all due respect to my banking friends, I was excited to get out of banks, right? And then all of a sudden, I'm like, well, now I gotta deal with exchanges, you know? I'm like, but I, I think I said to Kahina, one of, I was like, what do you mean? You don't have that on that exchange, like just you just do it. It's like no, I can't do it. I'm like really? So um, that was sort of a, 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 a uh -huh. interesting aha uh -huh as well. Um, but uh, yeah, so I mean, I think those are limitations. But the liquidity pools, when they become available, suddenly I think change those markets, and then I think that should bring in more more people, more customers, more players. And as that helps, it just becomes I think a replicable, you know, self fulfilling prophecy, right? That you get more efficient on trade, to get more efficient on rates when you compare those those pieces off. There's a saying we use of uh, liquidity begets liquidity, and one of the things that we talk Probably about- Probably nicer is, than chicken and an egg, yeah. <laughs> but the, the, what's been interesting, I think, for both of us to watch is at a time, and certainly uh, beneficial to Bitso, at a time overall crypto liquidity reduced from kind of June through maybe today, the overall market liquidity went down a bunch. Yep. The liquidity in MXN to XRP actually is way up because yes. of uh, what we're seeing there. So yeah, uh, no, I think, that's, I think that's right. And you know, what, what we're looking now um, in a lot of the Asian markets, so looking at um, Philippines, um, the interface with Australia, um, you know, having conversations with um, Japan, other countries, you know, one of the most inefficient things about our settlement process is being U.S. companies and everything is always kind of reverting back to U.S. dollars, right? right. So um, it doesn't make a lot of sense if you need Australian dollars and you need Filipino pesos uh, and you need U.S. dollars, you know, why can't you sort of pair those off and just net it through an XRP platform? And I think for me, that's what gets really pretty interesting is how do you think about not only optimizing the funds flows on a per transaction basis, but then how do you actually pair that back off in terms of the net settlement as well? Right. And I think if you can tie those together, those are the conversations that we've been having, I think it's just gonna transform and push this forward in a in really, really amazing way. I'm gonna open up to questions in a moment or two, so just uh, for people who would like to be ready in a moment. But maybe as a, as a final question up here, uh, talk to me, you mentioned earlier uh, opening new corridors, talk a little bit about that settlement. Uh, other things, you've been here for the last day and a half, had a lot of conversations. Yep. How else do you see kind of the Ripple MoneyGram partnership expanding? Uh, anything else you want to offer up? Yeah, sure. No, I think uh, a few pieces. I think uh, we, we have not been um, a big user of, of RippleNet yet. Um, I think we've been so focused on ODL on the platform there and, and the success that we've had um, that we really haven't had that chance to think differently about that. So a lot of the conversation um, with partners here has been learnings on RippleNet and how we can take advantage of that. Um, you know, I think for us, getting in uh, to uh, real-time transfers, so bank deposit transfers, wallet transfers using RippleNet, I think is a pretty exciting opportunity for us. Um, I also think um, utilizing what we have extremely uh, strong around the world is also the cash in and cash out, right? And I think that no matter what happens with the world in terms of crypto account services, account payments, Cash is going to be there for a very, very long time. So cash in, cash out, critical for the world. We do that extremely well, and so I think that there's an opportunity for us to, to plug into to the network in a very different way and, and open those um, open those systems up and, and those fund flows to, to our partners in the room and, and those that are interested in joining. So that's a huge piece. And then I do think still that the magic is going to be completely pairing off ripple net transactions with ODL. Right, because I think getting that perfectly paired transaction, so for the first time ever, you'd be able to say that money moved with the data yeah. and completed the transaction, and, and, and that's it. I think that would be just phenomenal. Awesome. All right, I will open it up to questions out in the audience. I might have one or two more uh, for Alex as we go here, but I'll uh, see if there's a... Mr. Arrington, I see your hand up. Yeah, can you hear me? 
Yeah. Uh, we'll, we'll repeat the question, but you're pretty loud. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> The question was, was partnering with Ripple one of the best or the best decisions of your life? I think was the question exactly. Let me maybe answer this way, uh, which I always, one of my favorite phrases, I think time will tell, uh, but so far so good. Actually, I, I'm curious about this because, uh -oh. uh, well, no, I say it's really positive way. I think so far. I knew I should have run that contract at that number. No, but what I'm, I think, had you told me when we signed the contract in June and announced the contract in June that we would be live as quickly as we were and have as much volume as quickly, I, I would not have believed you. No, oh, you, you, you would not have believed you, that's for sure, because yeah. you were definitely uh, in the bully pulpit for a while there telling me that well, this was what's going to happen and this. And I was like, all right, well, I got a good team down here. And, uh, you know, got, as I mentioned, the two good guys here and a really nice product team, great IT developers. Our, our leader here, Camilla, has been amazing, and uh, I think we've just pushed it really, really hard. So, yeah. um, I also, I understand too, and I don't remember what it was, but um, the last meeting that we that we had with, with your team, uh, I think you're making some enhancements to the platform based on some of the things that we have built, yeah, which I think sure. is pretty cool as well. Yeah, we're, we're learning, and I, I will say, I think for us, MoneyGram, have, you have exceeded our expectations of being just uh, very aggressive and out there and making, making it happen more quickly. But. All right, uh, other questions out there? Hello, Right here. Yes. Hi. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Uh, hi, my name is Jubin. Uh, so I was also excited to leave a, leave a bank at one point of time and you know join the tech world. Uh, I used to run correspondent banking for an international bank for quite some time, and I've seen how 50 years ago it's been the same way that banks have been selling correspondent banking. Uh, given your experience in MoneyGram and you know uh, what you've been doing on the payment space, where do you see uh, the payments landscape? Uh, how is it going to change in the next five years, and where is it headed? And do you see uh, a point of singularity being reached in the next five to ten years, where you see you know payments happening seamlessly across different networks across different countries? Wow, um, yeah, that is. Um, I'll take a couple different different slices of that. I think first and foremost, you know, it, it's always interesting. I think you said it quite well. You know, the, the more things change, the more they stay the same, right? So, you know, the, my fascination with correspondent banking is sort of like never ending. Um, uh, I, I have a, you know, I have a saying that, that, that goes something like this, banks always win. Um, and, uh, and, and the reason I say that is, is it's where the money ends up, right? So even, even through all of this, at the end of the day, what we're trying to get is, you know, back to fiat currency, and fiat currency has to land in a bank you know, along the way somewhere, right? So, you know, all the trades that we do on ODL, everything else through the platform, through the exchanges, um, phenomenal, right? And then it lands in a bank account. So, you know, I, I think at the end of the day, banks have a huge opportunity um, to really think differently and really kind of push the agenda forward. I think central banks in particular play a very interesting role um, in that. And, and the other saying I always sort of have going on in the back of my mind is that there's really no incentive for any country to want money to enter or leave um, in, a, in a rapid fashion, right? And so part of the challenge with correspondent banking is that banks themselves and central banks slow the flow of funds down deliberately, right? So all of us in this room, to a large degree, are trying to figure out ways to speed that up. And I think the challenge with that is that you're, you're sort of fighting against these forces that are saying we have no interest in speeding it up. And I think all the news that's come out, you know, and, and sort of the challenges with, with Libra and some of the other things that are happening, I think is reflective of that, right? What's ironic about it in some respects is that blockchain, right, is, is in theory more transparent than anything else, yet it's the most feared thing that's ever happened. So I think if central banks get on board with it and start thinking very differently about how they look at the flow of funds um, and how they think about utilizing their systems and applications to help speed up payment flows within country, I think that would massively improve the ability for cross-border to, to, also, to also speed up. So I think in the meantime, there's gonna be this type of Swell, for lack of a better word, right? Of people really, Perfect. yeah, man. You know, it's like it's like when you're looking for notes, you can stare at the screen and see swell. <laughs> swell. Um, 
But, uh, you know, uh, quite honestly, I, I, I do fundamentally believe that, you know, it's going to continue to be this, this, this forces like Ripple and others pushing against that and saying, what can we do differently? How can we make this work more efficiently and, and make it work better? So um, I think regulation plays a strong role in that as well. And, and that's something that really needs to catch up in a, in a big way because I think typically regulators slow it all down because they also want to catch up and try to understand it. And, and so I think that you see these these movements forward and then you slow a little bit and then you see another step function forward. So I, you know, I'm, I'm very bullish on payments in the next five, 10 years. I think it's going to be phenomenal. I think there's going to be some consolidation, um, but then there's going to be some new, new pieces of movement as well. I'm going to go to the audience one more, uh, one more question before we go back out there. Uh, I see a question over here, but you, you touched on Libra. One of the things I found interesting, it was when the Libra white paper was first announced, there were specifically call outs about, hey, you know, if Libra is successful, you'll never need the reference Western Union. Right. I, I'm, I'm curious what your reaction was uh, when some of that news came out. Well, the way I interpreted sort of the Libra was if, if it's successful, no one needs anything anymore. So um, <laughs> that was uh, kind of where I went. But no, I, I found it kind of interesting, right? I mean, I think what they're trying to do from, you know, create a stable coin, but then you have to actually pack it with fiat currency to me is sort of ironic, right? Um, I also think at the end of the day, you know, the, the fact that there was such an overreaction to it from a government perspective says two things. One is that I don't think they did a good enough job preparing the regulatory environment. That's something that we've done a lot of, of yeah. socialization and work with. Um, but the second thing too is, you know, uh, the volume of payments around the world is in the trillions, right? So $1 billion of backed, you know, crypto is not really gonna change anything or put any sort of payments flows at risk. So, um, you know, I'd like to, I don't not necessarily rooting for Libra, but I, I'd like to see successes in that space in a more, I think, um, deliberate way, because I do think it, it helps people think about the future and how do we move it forward. Yep, all right. There's a question, I think, over here. Yep. I don't know if you have a microphone or not. Question over here? I oh, do. Yep. Oh, I did. Oh, that mic's not working. Out of your back. Oh, wait, over here. This I, mic's working. Yeah. All right, but we'll come back to you one more. All right, guys, uh, Dustin Planholt, uh, Cryptonaires, Crypto Documentary. Uh, question is, uh, what excites you the most and going forward, what challenges do you see? Uh, and as well as your partnership, uh, what do you see overall? Is that for me or for you? That's uh, for you first, and then I'm gonna ask Brian to chime in. All right. Um, you know, again, I, I literally fundamentally believe that, you know, if, if the combination of these services and products plus whatever may be coming in the future can, can actually begin to move money with data, I, I mean, to me, that's the most exciting thing that we can possibly do, right? Pairing up all of our transactions perfectly, taking that volatility out of the market and, and actually literally moving things real time, to me, that's, I think, the most exciting aspect of, of what we're trying to create. Um, and, uh, but there's, there's, there's a lot to do. You have to build markets, you have to build products, you have to put the payments out there. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a roadmap, it's a, it's a, it's a journey. Right? Yeah. I, I'll just talk from, I, what, what I find most exciting about how things have evolved is uh, a year ago we were talking about ODL and Timex Rapid as, you know, an idea, yeah. wasn't live, we had done some test transactions, and you know, now we're sitting up here in a position where uh, we got you know, more than two dozen customers, we have real liquidity, it's, it feels very real, and taking something from experimentation, there are a lot of entrepreneurs in the room in various ways, Taking something from experimentation yeah. to actual production, and you know, as you said, we've learned from each other. I think during that journey, we'll continue to do that. And so, I'm excited by that. I'm excited by the, the regulatory wins. Uh, the, the trend line on the regulatory side, I think, is very positive. And I think we we saw that from some of the, the uh, panelists that you've seen up here. That there's still uh, some uncertainty. There's still some lack of clarity. But if I were a betting man, you know, I think the trend line is really positive. Thanks, Dustin. And uh, over here, I think. Yeah. Sorry, Shane Nixon from Hollisville, Canada. Uh, just curious to know, uh, are you able to quantify any of the sort of cost savings and whatnot uh, and how that reflects on your bottom line? And uh, do you see that sort of growing as you, you, as you expand from 10% to up uh, type of thing? It will be there more economies of scale, more savings there, or can you quantify that on a per transaction basis or your margins? Yeah, it's a little hard to, to quantify in, in total. I mean, it is a very small part of, of our you know um, global settlement platform at the moment. So you know, on a per transaction basis, um, you know, what's interesting is you know typically we're we're, we're playing in sort of a, a you know a spot or forward market. I think what's interesting about foreign exchange is that the more you buy 
farther out, the cheaper it is. Um, but that doesn't really help you in a real-time fashion, right? So, um, you know, to me, it, it's about um, it's about balancing the two the two pieces. And so we're, we are seeing, um, you know, funds flow. It's really fun. We've built some interfaces, and, and you can actually see the transaction flowing. You can buy the XRP. You can sell it back. You can actually see the money deposited into our bank account, right? And it's all real time, and it's happening, you know, virtually instantly. I think it's, you know, within a minute we sort of clear the trade. Within 15 minutes, you get a refresh on your bank account in Mexico that shows that the money's landed there. So, um, it, I would say that you know, it's in, in, in a percentage basis, it's definitely improving. Um, I would say that you know, we, we're actually going through some some ups and downs a little bit. I mean, sometimes this market is not the most efficient for, for a peso trade, right? So we don't necessarily execute the trade if it's not the right trade to make. So we're still balancing the two, we're still learning and as liquidity grows and, and, and becomes more available to us, then there'll be more opportunity to, to really do that. But right now, the scale of it and, and the size of it is you know a little small to be completely benefiting the bottom line, but definitely efficiencies are coming through for sure. Another question out here? Oh, right over here. Thank you. Um, I'm Noam from GMT in Tel Aviv. Full disclosure, we're a MoneyGram um, agent in Tel Aviv. Yes, you are. Uh, <laughs> well, he sort of stole uh, Alex's attention in his visit to Tel Aviv with the uh, Ripple. Um, oh, that's right. Yes, yeah, yeah. I was driving uh, around in vans like on the right. phone. You're welcome back anytime. Yeah, yeah. Um, so there were a lot of macro questions. I'd like to ask a micro question. Um, I've heard over the last day and a half, this repeated multiple times, can't send, can't wire money, money on a Sunday. Um, but like Alex said, was, you're still dependent on the local banks and the exchanges at both ends of the um, XRP transaction. Does it really solve the problem? That exchange still needs to credit your payout partner in Mexico or wherever it may be. And they're dependent on the local bank. Yeah. Did I talk about that? Why don't you start? You know, I, I think that uh, as Alex described earlier, there are limitations depending upon the, the, the bank receiving and are they 24 seven, what their limitations are. And as Alex described, there's some banks that are leaning in and making changes to their core systems to reflect that. There's some banks that I think are, are not. And uh, it depends where you are in the world. It depends which uh, kind of partner you have in that regard that I think will influence uh, how that plays out. One of the things Alex and I said backstage to each other, which I very much believe is, those that engage early and make some of these changes, and even at MoneyGram participate in RippleNet early, I think there are first mover, early mover advantages uh, that will accrue not just to the MoneyGrams, but also to the, the, you know, the customers that are able to benefit from that. But you're exactly right. I mean, at the end of the day, it's a whole system end to end, and if there's one broken chain, link in the chain, then it's, it's not gonna uh, fully have the funds there. Yeah. I mean, I would say too, at the end of the day, right? I mean, so some of this becomes the question of, is that fiat translation always necessary? And I think that that's the other big part of this, right? Which I think is at the end of the day, you know, if you're sort of, uh, I'll go out over my skis here a bit and say, but if you're, if you're kind of a pure crypto fan, it's really not about ever translating it back to fiat again, right? So then you have a completely different way of looking at that. So if I'm just doing an XRP handoff versus actually trying to trade it in and out, it's kind of a different conversation as well. So I do think some of it is a bit of a time evolution and it's also sort of a, 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 a you know, a, a utility and a need for, for the consumer. But there's different ways to think about it than always translating it back into the fiat piece and that's part of what we're also trying to solve for. Alex, it's great to have you here. It's great yeah. to be part of MoneyGram. We're so excited about the future. Uh, thank you for joining us out here today. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you all for sharing.